Wide Area Network WAN Technologies. So in the last lecture, lecture, we talked about the different types of circuits. We had our dedicated, we had circuit switched and packet switched uh, WAN connections. Now we're going to talk about those specific connections as we look through all the different technologies. So our dedicated lease lines are things like T1s, E1s, T3s, and E3s. Uh, these are dedicated circuits that you buy from your telecommunications provider. They provide a point-to-point -point connection between two different sites, and the nice thing is you get all of the bandwidth all of the time. Digital circuits are usually measured in 64 kilobit per second channels called DS0, or digital signal zero units. You're going to have a channel service unit and a data service unit. So it's one box, it's called a CSU-DSU, that will terminate the digital signal at your location. So as you can see here in the bottom right corner, you can see there's a router connected by a serial cable to a CSU-DSU, which is then connected by a T1 circuit back to the telecommunications provider that gets you onto the internet. Um, another way that you might see this is between two different offices, if you had a dedicated connection, up, such as a left corner there, we have a CSU-DSU connecting with a uh, dedicated link to a European office through their CSU-DSU. So some examples of digital service levels are here on the chart. Uh, there's a lot of different ones out there. The main ones you want to be able to know the speeds of are the T1, which is 1.544 megabits per second. The T3, which is 44.736 megabits per second. If you remember that one's about 45, you're going to be okay. Uh, and then the next one you want to know is your E1, which is 2.0 megabits per second. E1 is the European standard. It's how they measure their digital signals over there. We in the States use the T1 as our basis for everything, uh, which is 1.544. The one thing that, to note about the uh, T1 is in the old days when businesses would get a T1, it wasn't just for data. They could actually break it up into voice channels as well. And so the T1 would actually provide you with 24 voice channels or up to 1.544 megabits per second of speed because each voice channel took 64 kilobits. The next technology we're going to talk about is Metro Ethernet. Ethernet is becoming much more common and less expensive than it used to be. Uh, and so as that's happened, Metro Ethernet is gaining popularity. What service providers are doing is they're bringing Ethernet interfaces to their customers as opposed to having to use a CSU-DSU. This technology is used by the service provider, is hidden from us as the customer, and all we get is an Ethernet jack to use. We plug that into our router, set up the configuration, and we're on the network. It makes it a lot easier for us and it has a very low configuration barrier for most people. Uh, Metro Ethernet is available in most major cities and it's still rolling out through the rest of the country. The next thing we have is what's called the point-to-point -point protocol. And point-to-point -point protocol is actually a layer 2 protocol that we use on top of our dedicated lease lines, because the line itself is a layer 1. Uh, simultaneously, we're able to use multiple layer 3 protocols like IP or, or the older IPX over point-to-point -point protocol. And each layer 3 is run on a separate link control protocol, uh, which is part of PPP's infrastructure. It allows us to have multi-link interfaces that allow multiple physical connections to be bonded together to create a logical interface, very similar to what we talked about with link aggregation control protocol where we bonded those, uh, those uh, switched links together. Here we can do that with WAN links. And so maybe I could take two or three T1s to, and group them together to get 4.5 megabits per second of service instead of the standard 1.5. Uh, loop link detection is a layer 2 loop, can be detected and prevented, so we can prevent those um, switching loops that can occur. They also provide you some error detection, so your frames, if they have errors, can be detected and discarded and retransmitted if needed. And then we have authentication, uh, which is where the device on the other end can actually authenticate the link, so you can use something like a username and password. Uh, PPP was very common, especially when we used to use uh, cable modems and DSL in the early days. We used what was called PPPoE to do our authentication onto the network. So PPP authentication can be done in several methods. We can do it with PAP, CHAP, or MSCHAP. PAP was the password authentication protocol. It was a one-way authentication between a client and a server. And what would end up happening here is I would send my username and password in clear text over the network, which meant people could see it uh, if they were snooping, which is why PAP has lost popularity. And what would happen with this one-way authentication is I would send it to the server, and if I was successful, I would be able to get online. With CHAP, we had a challenge handshake authentication protocol. It did a one-way authentication, but it used a three-way handshake. 
And so the credentials were actually hashed before the transmission, so if somebody was snooping, they wouldn't be able to see your username and password. MSCHAP was Microsoft's version of CHAP, and it's a Microsoft Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. Basically, Microsoft threw some things on top of CHAP, including a two-way authentication instead of a one-way authentication. So there was a challenge response, as you can see in the bottom left of the slide, where CHAP on the top only had the challenge acknowledgement. Point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet, or PPPoE, as I said earlier, was very common with DSL modems and even the early cable modems. What it did was it actually used the PPP framing within Ethernet frames to send them over the network. And this allowed us to do authentication for Ethernet. So if you see PPPoE, usually you're referencing here DSL and sometimes cable modems. So DSL is our digital subscriber line. It was very common in residential and small office and home office environments, and it provided high-speed data transmission over existing telephone wiring. And the way it works is you would still be able to talk on the phone and then use the higher and lower portions of the frequency on the phone that aren't used for voice to send data. And these things could get uh, pretty high speeds. Uh, they were very, very popular until the move to fiber optic came out and cable modems that had faster speeds than DSL, and so cable modems became more prevalent. With digital subscriber lines, we had three different technologies. We had asynchronous DSL, synchronous, uh, symmetric, excuse me, asymmetric DSL, symmetric DSL, and very high bitrate DSL. So asymmetric DSL, or ADSL, had a maximum distance from the provider of 18,000 feet. You could do voice and data on the same line, and you could have a downstream or download speed of up to 8 megabits per second. Your upload speeds were limited to about 1.544 megabits per second which was important because, again, that's at T1 speed. So these things were actually faster than T1s, and they were a lot cheaper. Next, we had the symmetric DSL, which provided us the same speed for upload and download. Now, because we actually gave the same speed to upload and download, we actually had a slower overall speed because we didn't have the fast download and slower upload. Um, with these, you couldn't do simultaneous voice and data, and they were seen as a replacement for ISDN lines and T1 lines for most businesses. Uh, maximum distance from the provider was 12,000 feet, so you had to be a little bit closer. And then we had the very high bitrate DSL, which you had to be even closer. You could only be 4,000 feet away, less than a mile. And the downstream on this was up to 52 megabits per second, which was very fast for DSL, which is why it's called very high bitrate DSL. The upload speed was 12 megabits per second. Now, why would you want different upload and download speeds? Well, the majority of users do a lot more downloading than they do uploading. If you think about your average day on the internet, you're watching videos, you're downloading content from Facebook, you're receiving emails, all of that is download. It's all received for you. So having a faster download speed gave a better customer experience than a faster upload speed. Most people aren't uploading a lot of data unless you're publishing a lot of videos or uploading a lot of photos. Other than that, you're downloading almost, most, almost exclusively when you're using the internet. The next technology we have is cable modems. And cable modems were able to transmit and receive over the current cable television infrastructure. And the way this worked is it would use what is called the hybrid fiber coax system, which is an HFC uh, distribution network that provided cable television infrastructure to homes using both co coaxial and fiber optic cabling. This allows us to get very, very high speeds over cable lines. Uh, most cable modems can go up into the 150 megabits per second download uh, with their higher speed tiers. They use specific frequency ranges for upload and download speeds, uh, for upload and download transmissions, and we use this with what is called DOCSIS, or Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. On the exam, if you see the word DOCSIS, they're talking about cable modems. Okay, Keep that in mind. DOCSIS is cable modem related. The next thing we have here is a satellite modem, uh, and I have one picture there from HughesNet just to give you an example. But essentially, these are used in remote, rural, and disconnected locations when DSL and cable modem connections aren't readily available. So this gives you a fast speed like a DSL modem, but the big problem here is you're going to have low bandwidth usage and charges for going over that limit. So if you're planning on using this to watch your Netflix or your Hulu account, you're going to burn through that data very, very quickly, just like if you were on your cell phone. So some other issues you have with satellite is you have to consider the fact of the space geometry here. So as you can see in the picture here, you have a customer who, when they want to go online, has to go from them up to the satellite, down to the service provider, and then out to the internet. Every time you go up to the satellite or down to the satellite, you have about an eighth of a second delay. So every time I go up and down to the satellite, that's about a quarter of a second. 
So it's not a real big deal if I'm doing something like going on Facebook, but if I'm trying to use this for a VoIP service, for instance, voice over IP, you're going to hear that delay in the person's voice. Uh, the other problem you have with satellite is weather conditions. If you have a snowstorm or a thunderstorm that's at the, either your location where you're receiving it or at the service provider's location where they're receiving it, you're going to have problems. For instance, if you have a satellite provider who's located in Colorado for their downlink and it has a snowstorm, even though you're in sunny Miami, you might not have service at that point. So you have to consider that because uh, any kind of thunderstorm or snowstorm between you and the, the satellite and the receiver can cause problems for you. The next one we have is the old school method, which is called the plain old telephone service or POTS. And what POTS is, is it runs on the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, and it consists of all the telephone carriers around the world. So when we first started getting on the internet, we were all using dial-up modems, and these use POTS service. What we would end up doing is we would dial over our phone line into a central repository at our ISP, and they would connect us to the internet. These analog connections could either carry voice or data, and they would use our PSTN or the and use plain old telephone service connections. The big problem you have here is you're limited to 56 kilobits per second of data, which is considerably slow and unusable for most of the internet today um, because it only was able to access one 64 kilobit channel, which is what your voice circuit at your house was. Uh, it was one channel off of the provider. And so your 56 plus the overhead gets you to 64. The next one we have is ISDN. And ISDN, you could actually carry multiple 64K, either voice or data channels, which are called bearer channels, B channels, on a single connection. Back in the 80s, this was very popular, and it was designed to carry voice, video, and data over these B channels. D channels, or delta channels, or data channels, existed for 64K signaling data, just like in our T1 connections. If you remember I said with a T1 connection, we had 24 64K channels. These, this is how a, an ISDN could also be broken up. So the circuits were classified as either basic rate, BRI, or primary rate, BRI, uh, PRI. The BRI offered two 64K channels, there are two B channels, and one data channel of 16K. The PRI, you could actually have 23 B channels and one 64K D channel. Um, each of those B channels, again, can hold voice or video. So what you'd see in a lot of small businesses is they would get a BRI connection two 64K channels, which then gave them a 128K connection. This was back when dial-up was actually operating at 28K, so having a 128K connection was significantly faster. Nowadays, ISDN is pretty much being relegated um, to the past because it is very slow compared to what we can get with DSL, cable modems, or fiber optic modems. Uh, the only place you're really going to see ISDN nowadays is in some older video teleconference suites that people still have this as a legacy network. You're not going to run into it much in your actual networks. The next one we have is Frame Relay. Um, because of the popularity of cable and DSL, Frame Relay has been decreasing market share. Uh, frame Relay were connected via virtual circuits. We basically create a virtual circuit for each person. Uh, each of these virtual circuits would be point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint connections. Uh, in this particular case, we have a point-to-multipoint connection where we have New York, Austin, and Orlando all being connected together. It is a layer two technology and it's always on or an on-demand where it can create it like a circuit. Uh, the nice thing about Frame Relay was it had relatively low cost and widespread availability compared to your traditional T1 lines or E1 lines or T3 lines. So it was very popular uh, back in the day, but again, the cost is not as cheap as cable or DSL service, so most people have been moving to cable and DSL uh, or fiber optic. The next one we have is ATM, or Asynchronous Transfer Mode. Um, ATN is a layer 2 technology that uses what we call PVCs or permanent virtual circuits or they use switch virtual circuits, SVCs. It's very similar to the way Frame Relay works except all of the frames are fixed length. So with Frame Relay you could actually have multiple sizes of cells which led to more overhead. With ATM everything had a 48 byte payload and a 5 byte header. So these 53 byte cells were always being sent around and because it always knew how much it was going to expect it could actually transmit these faster and have less overhead. So this increased the speed of transmissions and ATM was used and is still used for a lot of fiber optic backbones and transmission of data. So with our ATM virtual circuits we have the user network interface, the UNI, and we have the network node interface which is the NNI. The UNI is used to connect the ATM switches and endpoints together. The NNI is used to connect the switches together themselves. You can see that in the diagram here in the bottom right where we have 
the router to the switch is UNI, and then the networks themselves are connected. The routers are connected through the NNIs. Um, each of these have a virtual circuit identifier, like we talked about, the VPI VCI, as you can see on the left. And each VCI is indicative of a customer, and the VPI is the path going to and from multiple customers. The next one we have is what's called multiple label, uh, multi protocol label switching, or MPLS. This is actually used by service providers and it's popular because we can support multiple protocols on the same network, which is why it's called multiple protocol label switching. It supports you using both frame relay and ATM on the same MPLS backbone. So it's very good for service providers because they can support both technologies. It allows traffic to be dynamically routed based on load conditions and path availability. So for instance, if one router is getting backed up and bogged down, it can actually route around that based on the current load availabilities. Label switching is more efficient than using layer 3 IP address routing, and so it can actually do things faster going from point to point this way. Uh, service providers use this to forward data in the back end. You as a customer are going to be unaware of this because you don't really care. MPLS is used on big networks and the backbones, not used by us inside of our own personal networks. In our networks, we're still going to be relying on IP layer 3 routing, um, and then that will get label switched once it gets to the backbone. The last one we have here is virtual private network. And what a virtual private network is, is an overlay network that is established by creating an encrypted tunnel between two separate locations. So as you can see here in the diagram, I have a branch office and a corporate hub that want to communicate to each other securely. Instead of having to buy a dedicated connection like a T1, I can use a virtual private network to do this. And what I'm doing is creating an encryption tunnel over the dirty internet and allowing us to go through it without people seeing what we're doing. VPNs allow our internet to be used as our WAN connection. So if my branch office has a local DSL line and my corporate hub has a local cable modem, we can create a VPN between the two, and that way we can connect them without having to pay for a connection all the way between the two of them. Uh, VPN tunnels use authentication and encryption, so users on the unsecure network can't read or decrypt the traffic we're sending because essentially we're inside of this tube. And this allows our company to connect multiple remote locations without needing dedicated lease line access at these locations, saving us a ton of money, and they're not very difficult to set up. We'll talk more about VPNs and the actual encryption and authentication portion in a separate lecture. So when we're looking at our WAN data rates, uh, we look at the bandwidth that, is, that we use, and it's either going to be measured in bits per second, kilobits per second, megabits per second, or gigabits per second, just like our local area network connections are. Another way we can measure them is what we call OC levels, which is optical carrier. So all of these are based off OC1. So when you have an OC1, it's 51 and change, 51.84 megabits per second. If I had an OC3, I just multiply that by 3, getting me 155.52. If I have an OC12, it gets multiplied by 12, which gets me up to about 612 megabits per second, and so on. Uh, with frame relay, we're dealing with speeds that can be either as low as 56 kilobits up to a speed of what a T1 line is of 1.544 megabits per second. T3, we had mentioned before, was 44.736 megabits per second, right around 45. Uh, E1's just over 2 megabits per second. ATM, we're dealing with the 155 through 622 range because they're operating on those optical carriers, either between an optical carrier 3 and an optical carrier 12. And then SONET, which can be anywhere from an OC1 all the way up to an OC3072, which is 159 gigabits per second. That's a pretty fast WAN connection and will cost you some significant money. And the main ones that you want to memorize, which is OC1, T1, E1, and ATM. Those are the ones that tend to come up on exam day. And that is our wide area networks technologies.